The Central Intelligence Agency, also known as the CIA, was formed in the summer of 1947 to coordinate government intelligence gathering at the beginning of the Cold War. For the next 40 years, the CIA often deposed governments that the United States considered hostile or unfriendly to its foreign policy. As a result, the CIA was one of many agencies that widely countered the activities of the Soviet Union and other socialist governments. One specific example of this was in Nicaragua. In 1979, at the end of the Nicaraguan Revolution, the left-wing Sandinista National Liberation Front took power. Fearing a potential ally of the Soviet Union, the CIA began supporting various right-wing militias against the Sandinistas, referred to as the Contras, short for La Contra Revolution, translating to the Counter-Revolution. After support for unsanctioned paramilitary action in Nicaragua waned, the U.S. Congress refused to continue supporting groups like the Contras in 1984. But the CIA continued to do so in spite of the law. In late 1986, it became publicly known that the CIA was still supporting the Contras through a complicated scheme that involved reimbursing Israel for selling weapons to Iran at the United States' request, which would later be sold to Nicaraguan Contras. During this period, the CIA recruited people from UMass and other colleges. Given the secretive and imperialistic nature of the CIA, exacerbated by their recent actions in Nicaragua, many students found this repulsive. On October 4, 1986, students at UMass formed the Stop CIA Recruitment Organizing Committee in response to seeing CIA recruitment ads on campus. UMass Amherst student resistance continued with a candlelight vigil for people killed in Nicaragua on November 13, 1986, as well as protesting at the University Career Center, where a pre-interview information session was planned for potential CIA recruits. Student action succeeded in preventing this event from happening, but it was rescheduled to a then undisclosed location and time to prevent further protest. This led to protests on November 14th and the occupation of the Affirmative Action Office and Whitmore Administration Building by demonstrators in an attempt to negotiate with the Chancellor, which resulted in 11 arrests. Tensions only continued to rise after this point, and after repeated failures for students and administration to come to an agreement, another protest was planned on November 24th, this time a march from the Student Union to Whitmore, with about 700 students participating. After reaching their destination and finding a heavy police barricade, about 150 students occupied the nearby Munson Hall. After a court order attempted to force students out, the remaining 60 occupied protesters were arrested under trespassing charges. On the next day, November 25, 1986, our 68 protesters, most of them UMass Amherst undergraduate students, were arraigned on their various charges of disorderly conduct and trespassing. Though notably among the protesters arrested were anti-Vietnam War activist Abby Hoffman and Amy Carter, President Jimmy Carter's daughter. Of the 68 people arrested, 13 were put on trial, under the agreement that the verdict of their trial would apply to the other protesters. During this period, students organized to pay legal fees, protest outside the courthouse, and contact expert witnesses to strengthen the defense's case. They organized affinity groups for keeping protesters safe and held dances, talks, and movie nights to raise awareness. After November 24th, no UMass Amherst protesters against the CIA were arrested. The students and their allies were defended by the Student Legal Services Office and Leonard Weinglass. The protesters' team used the common law necessity defense. Now, this is a very rare tactic to use in criminal proceedings, and it's even more uncommon for it to be successful. It places a burden on the defense to show that the crime they were accused of was committed to stop or prevent another crime. In this case, they were attempting to prove that the CIA had violated international law. The prosecution only allowed this due to heavy community pressure. As public discourse around the CIA in Western Massachusetts was becoming more and more negative, and in exchange for the ability to handpick the jury. The defense focused on two main ideas. The first was to prove that the CAA was a criminal organization who caused harm. The second was that the protests and occupation of Munson Hall were a way of preventing greater harm. The testimony of people like Howard Zinn and Daniel Ellsberg were critical to proving these. Zinn's testimony spoke to the historical use of disruption to prevent harm while well, Ellsberg described his own illegal but necessary acts of resistance to prevent the U.S. government from committing atrocities. 
Ellsberg had, in the past, leaked classified documents, now known as the Pentagon Papers, which proved that the United States government had lied to the public about the scope, goals, and chances of victory in the Vietnam War. Professor Zinn testified on the role that protest has on foreign policy, a field which is not built to be run democratically. He further testified that while no way is the only way for students to affect recruitment policy at the university, he would doubt that you could change it without some sort of protest action. After much more testimony and arguments from both sides, the decision on what to do with these 13 protesters was left with the jury. On April 15, 1987, that jury came to a not guilty decision, and that verdict applied to the other 55 people arrested. What say you, Madam Foy Lady? Is the defendant, Raymond J. Elaine, guilty or not guilty of the alleged complaint of trespassing? Not guilty. This is a powerful example of student activism having a clear impact on foreign policy. The protesters occupying Munson Hall had a difficult moral dilemma. They could violate the law by trespassing in a building they were not allowed to enter, or they could remain complicit as innocent lives were lost. Ultimately, they chose the former and helped push for a less violent approach to foreign policy the only way they could. Students recognized that the CIA perpetuates gross forms of violence and decided to fight against it. In doing so, they prove that our voices are powerful enough to create the world that we want to see. As student activists and organizers of UMass Amherst, they left behind an incredible legacy and we can draw inspiration and strength from them every day in our fight for justice and equity at this university.